So we are on the bottom of Lamed Gimel and Aleph, bottom of 33a. We're on our list of mitzvah Shiva Dibur, commandments of verbalization, things we have to say in fulfillment of some commandment. And we're on the list of such items that can be done in, in, in any language. Now, I mentioned a few times that the commission itself, when it lists the things you can say in any language, brings no citation. But when it comes to the verses or it comes to the mitzvahs where you have to say them in the original Hebrew, the original Lashon HaKodesh, the Mishnah does bring citation as indication that the default is saved in any language. Right? Otherwise, the Mishnah would have to bring verses for both. The fact that it brings no verses, following or no, the fact that the verses, the, the fact that the Mishnah brings no citation to indicate that you can say these mitzvahs in any language is indicative of the fact that the Mishnah believes that that's the default. Why shouldn't you say it in any language? When there are mitzvahs you have to say specifically in Lashon Kurdish, you got to bring a citation to tell you, oh, this mitzvah has to be done in Lashon Kurdish. Because default is say it in whatever language you want, because why not? Right? Is that clear? Yeah? Now, but the Gemara does go through the list of mitzvahs you can say in any language and does bring citation to that. Right? The Gemara does. The Mishnah didn't, but the Gemara does. Yes? Looking at me. Yes? Yes? Why are they doing it if the default is Mishnah? That's where I'm going. But from the manner in which you'll see, we'll see today specifically, that's why I'm making this introduction again. The manner in which the Gemara brings the citation to today to the verses that you could say it in any language mm -hmm. itself is indicative that that's the default. The manner in which these verses are cited to you, especially as Rashi formulates it. This is where I'm going. And the default understanding is if God says to say something, he wants you to say it in any way you understand. That's a default. Unless the Torah specifically says, I want you to say it in the original Hebrew. So even though the Gemara is going to cite the verses that indicate that you can say it in any language, you're going to see from the manner in which those citations are made that the Gemara is understanding it also as the default, say it in whatever language you want. I think because the Gemara is reading that default into the verses, as we'll see. Mm -hmm. So, for example, just the last two. For example, when it came to um, Shema, the Mishnah had a back and forth because there was indication to do it in the original language, Bahayu. And there was an indication in the verse to say it in any language you want, Shema, you should hear, listen, you should process. And the Gemara went through the struggle of balancing those two. And then when it came to prayer, the Gemara straight out said, well, you're talking to God, so talk to however you want, right? And we're going to see a very similar thing in the next items, even though the Gemara is going to cite the verses. And I'm going to show you a Rashi that really indicates what I'm saying. Okay? So this is where we are. To fill in is not something you have to say. It's something you have to put on. It's a separate mitzvah. The putting on of tefillin is an independent mitzvah of the prayers you say when you're wearing tefillin. They're two separate mitzvahs. The mitzvah of tefillin is to put it on. That's it. The mitzvah itself, yes. If you put them on and took them off, you fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin. You do, but it's not connected to the mitzvah of tefillin. They're separate mitzvahs. We do a number of mitzvahs together. Tefillin, tzitzis, prayer, shema, mentioning the exodus from Egypt. It's at least five mitzvahs we're doing during our 30-minute uh, prayer in the morning. But they're all independent mitzvahs. In theory, you can do them all independently. I'm driving in the car. It's like you're driving somewhere. From place to Uber, I can just grab it, throw it on. Okay, what you should do is different than what the mitzvahs are. You should pull over the car and pray like for half an hour and then keep on driving, right? But just because you're doing them all together, it doesn't mean they're, they're, they're one mitzvah. It's a number of mitzvahs being done together, which you are obliged to do together. You stop someone on the street and you put on tefillin with them. And all you do is say Shema with them. They didn't pray. That's another mitzvah they didn't do. They didn't put on a talus. It's another mitzvah they missed out. But it doesn't take away from the fact that they did the mitzvah of tefillin and the mitzvah of Shema if it's in the right time frame. Right, so the separate mitzvahs we do together. So the mitzvah of tefillin is not a verbalization mitzvah, it's a mitzvah of action that we combine with mitzvahs of verbalization, prayer, Shema, Exodus of Egypt. 
trying to think of other ones. It's probably other ones there too. Okay, so the blessing that you make is not the same thing to pray you do after. The blessing you make is a rabbinic commandment that whenever you do a mitzvah, you thank Hashem for the mitzvah. But if a person did it without the blessing, he still did the biblical mitzvah to fill it. Right? Even though you're obliged to do much more. Right? But the, S, the essential mitzvah still remains independent of the other actions, which you happen to, happen to be obliged to do. Clear? There's many mitzvahs like that where you do a number of mitzvahs together and you're obliged to do them all, even though they're independent. For example, taking tefillin, for example, the, the head tefillin and the arm tefillin are two separate mitzvahs. So a person put on the head tefillin and took them off. He did the mitzvah. There are other mitzvahs he didn't do, like the hand tefillin, like Shema, this, that, but he still did that mitzvah. So is he obligated to put the hand tefillin on? Of course he is. But that mitzvah was still a mitzvah, right? So there's a number, so, so there you go, it's six. Hand to fill in, head to fill in, palace, Shema, prayer, and Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. There's probably more I'm missing in, in, in we do during our, our prayer in the morning. Each one, there's a bunch of mitzvahs that you've done your work. That's right. I thought it was just one so Quite a few. This is what we say every time we read the Pekyovis. Yovis. Rabbi Hanani Makash Emer, Rabbi Hanani Makash says, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakas, he says, Hashem wanted to give or increase the merit of the Jewish people. The Fichot, therefore, he increased the amount of mitzvahs. He could have said one mitzvah, we're two prayers, we're tefillin. But Hashem wants you to have two mitzvahs. He said two mitzvahs, one in the hand, one in the head. So God made it in such a way that one activity, prayer in the morning, has like a bunch of mitzvahs in it. Right? And likewise with any mitzvahs like that. Sorry? Thank you. That's, that's, that's the meaning of that, of that statement. Hashem wanted to increase the merit, so he added mitzvahs. Okay, so the next item on the list of mitzvah is Shibbat Dibur. Commands of, I keep on saying verbalization. Is that the right way to say it? Command of speech, command of verbalization. So the next item on the list of such a mitzvah that can be done in any language is birches amazon, the grace after meals, the benching. That can be done in any language. So if you look at the narrow set of lines in the middle of Lamed Gimel Modal of 33a, count up four lines and you'll see it right there. Five lines. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. From the bottom of the <laughs> narrow set of lines. Yeah. So, Birch um, grace after meals, can be said in any language. The verse reads, You shall eat, you'll be satisfied, and you'll bless God. You'll bless God, your Lord. You're instructed to bless God. So, bless God in whatever language you want to bless Him. Does that sound like an, does that sound like a verse that changed its language in order to inform you of a special law that you can say it in any language? That's not the way the verse the Gemara is presenting this. The Gemara is presenting is the verse is to bless Hashem. So bless him however you want. Meaning the reason why the, the way the Gemara derives from this verse that you can say it, in, say it in any language is not from a positive instruction from the verse you may say it in any language, but from not telling you a restriction on what language. So the verse itself is indicative that the default is in any language you want. And indeed, look at Rashi. Look at Rashi. So if you look at Rashi's, you'll see the boulder. It says, mm-hmm. Sorry? Exactly. It just leaves it blessed. That's right. Rashi's words are, Deloi ba'ikra. Because the Torah did not indicate to you to be said in a different language. And from where should I say, yeah, you need the original language? So Rash is telling us that the derivation here is not a positive derivation. Torah says, you can say it in any language. Torah says to bless. And because the Torah did not restrict it unto what language, therefore you can say it in any language, because that's the default. So even the Gemara's indication itself in the verse is not because, like you asked, you asked, if the default is said in any language, why is the Gemara going to the verses? The Gemara is demonstrating from the verses that the, de- that the default is saying in a language. It's, like support for the Mishnah. It, it's, not even, it, it's not so much support as it is giving you the backstory of the Mishnah's thinking. The Mishnah's thinking that the default is in any language is itself derived from the verse because the verse gives no restriction. So say it in any language. Exactly. And the same thing with the next, the next uh, description. And Rashi Mamish plays this out perfectly in every, in every line. The next mitzvah was shvua sa'edus, a vow of, of um, 
testimony. This is a case where um, one person knows information about someone else and I uh, administer a vow against someone else that might know information about me. And in this vow, I'm kind of like, so to speak, cursing anyone who knows information that's not sharing because this person's withholding with testimony. Yeah. So say this. it's the vow of testimony. Either, either a person's taking the vow that I don't know anything, or I'm taking a vow indicating that someone else knows something and I'm uh, uh, you know, cursing, the, taking a vow and cursing the one who doesn't know something and doesn't say something because this person has testimony that might help me. So that too could be done in any language. So the Ksid, because the verse reads, Benefesh Kisechta, when a person does a sin, Navashama Kol Allah, the witness hears a, the voice of a curse, the vow that the other person is saying, and still withholds his witness and still doesn't testify. So the verse goes on to say, I'm pulling up the verse. So he carries the burden of the sin because he knows he's not saying anything. Okay. So says the Gemara, because the verse says, Vishaman, you hear, therefore it can be done in any language or that the person hears. Right? This goes back to what the Gemara said about the Shema. So when the Pasuk says Shema, the Pasuk says, listen, implying that the listener has to observe and understand. So likewise here, it says that the, that the observer, the witness, hears the voice of the curse, and that's the vow that's being administered upon him. And therefore, he carries the burden of the sin because he's not testifying. Right? So here, this seems to come to mind what I'm saying. Because if here, actually, the verse is giving. <laughs> Isn't there a Russian word? Testifying court? It's an obligation. No, not to court. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking I about in court. Talk talking about in court. You, something happened. I observed. I'm withholding testimony. But you know that if I would say something, it would vindicate you. So in court, you're like demanding that Levi you come to court, and I'm refusing. So because I'm refusing, I carry the burden of the sin because I'm refusing to come to court and testify on your behalf. So you administer an oath that cursed be Mr. X, not Levi, but Mr. X for not coming forward and testifying. I see a, a rabbi driving the tire. Take it to court. No, I shut up. Yeah, take it to court. It's God's problem. I don't know, maybe he's driving his wife to the hospital, he's giving birth. I have no idea. But you. It's God's problem. Because otherwise, it's Okay, yeah, so we're here to question. We're here to question coming to court. Yeah. So now, here, here's something interesting that Ash tells us. This seems to undermine what I said. I was saying that the default setting is in any language. But here, the Torah actually adds a word to indicate that it has to be, that it can be done in any language. It adds the words, Vishoma, and he hears, as opposed to saying, and an oath was administered. That seems to undermine what I'm saying. The Torah, the Torah in this case, the Torah seems not to be giving the default any language. It's changing the language, saying that the person hears to indicate you have to be able to process and understand, undermining what I'm suggesting. And there's a beautiful Rashi. And the Gemara asks the question. Actually, Rashi formulates a question. That's not in our Gemara, but Rashi formulates it, which is, how do we know that the vow, the vow of witness be done in any language? So in explaining that question, says Rashi, because had the verse not said that the person about which the vow is being administered hears it, I would have compared it to the mountain of the curses and the blessings. Right? The Mishnah told us that the cursing and the blessings was definitely done in Hebrew. And any time you can compare a mitzvah to those to that event, it's got to be done in Hebrew. Rashi says the vow administered to this person who, who witnessed an event, that might have been compared to the curses and the blessings. Because the curses and the blessings were also such a vow. They were the Jewish people were administered a vow. If you follow Hashem's command, you'll be cursed. You'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. Which is literally what's happening to this guy. You bear the testimony. You saw something. You're not stepping forward. So we're administering our oath to curse to you. So that was what's Rashi telling us? That really the default is any language. Why does the verse here need to give indication that you can say it in any language, that you can say it in any language if it's a default? Why give a special indication? 
answer because without that special indication, I would have compared it to those vows that are dafke and Hebrew. Rashi didn't have to add that, but he did add that, further supporting my contention. I shouldn't say my contention. I got this contention because I read the Rashi's. It's the other way around. I read the Rashi and I'm looking like, why, why is Rashi busy with that? Why does it explain why the Gemara is looking for a verse? The Gemara is always looking for a verse. So answer, because the Gemara doesn't need to look for a verse because the direct default is any language. So if the Gemara is going to look for a verse and find a special verse to say that you could say it in any language means, because I might've mistakenly thought you could say it, you have to say it in Hebrew. Why would I have mistakenly thought that that way? Because it's administering an oath and curse that's very similar to the administering of oath and curse at the mountains. And that was definitely in Hebrew. So I might've made the mistake. Therefore the Torah has to give you a special dispensation. No, you say it in any language because that's really the default. Which is why when it came to the benching, all Rashi says is, Torah says to bless, no restriction. So go to default, say it in any language. Further supporting this understanding. Robert, you followed or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. You need to make that distinction between the blessings and the curses. On that's right. And Rashi have to add that in. The Gemara doesn't say this. That's right. That's right. And the Gemara doesn't do that. Rashi does that. Indicating that Rashi is learning this into the Gemara. Rashi adds that layer to the Gemara. The Gemara doesn't say that. All the Gemara says is, how do we know that it can be done in any language? Because it says the person hears the curse. And he hears it and you have to process it. So Rashi has to go through a whole explanation. Why did the Gemara do that? Ah, because I would have made a mistake. Because we did the default. Following? That, that's, that's my understanding of Rashi. Yeah, what do we say something? No, no, it just makes sense because if there was any question about the shua, well, here's the here's the answer. Exactly, exactly. Because otherwise, the Torah could have just said, "Take the oath," and that wouldn't have been the default any language. But that wouldn't have been, even though that is the default. In this case, I might have made a mistake, considering of how similar it is to the specific Hebrew one, which is the curses in the mountains, which the which the Mishnah used as the prototype case for all. Specific Hebrew speaking mitzvahs. It's also completely logical. Completely logical. Administering oath, administering oath, curses, curses, etc. Someone's going to testify, like in Quebec, you know, someone's going to testify that you should be able to testify in the language where we understand the questions. And... Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison to go over here. There's a whole kerfuffle about maintaining a certain language. And you see the Gemara itself struggles with this. Mm -hmm. Tire itself, in some ways, wants to. Maintain the original language in some ways gives a leash and says, speak in your language because you have to understand. So that's an interesting. Uh, it's an odd everything can be found in Torah. You see, and you find this here too in the Torah. Sorry? Sorry, you know, I want to tell you a story. It's very important and it's, and, and it's connected to what Barry just said. The story goes, I shared the story before, but it's a, and it's a famous story. Never relates the story in, in a famous talk. The previous ever was once traveling. The previous ever was once traveling comes to a hotel and he meets, we're going to some sort of rabbinical conference. And in the hotel, he meets the other rabbis and they're discussing which political theory does Torah support? Capitalism, socialism, communism, which one does Torah support? And each one brought a proof from a different mitzvah, a different passage or teaching in Torah for their position. position. And the, the previous rabbi is sitting quietly. So they ask him, well, what's your opinion? So basically he said, you guys are all right and you're all wrong. Taira is the epitome of wisdom. Taira is the epitome of goodness. Everything else in the world has partial good, partial negative. Everything in the world is a mix, right? There's, there's no, we discussed this earlier, there's no perfection, everything's great. So every political philosophy will have some element of good and some element of negative. And the element of good that every political philosophy has is the one you're finding in Taira. Right? So even this idea of protecting the language has its source in Torah too. Because everything has a source in Torah. And here we find it right here. Where Torah itself, under certain situations, wants to preserve the original language. I'm not supporting Glagoe's position. It's not the point being made here. If you're saying how oh, everything is found in Torah, even that which we disagree with, there's always a redemptive element, some element of good there, and that element of good is to be found in Torah. So that's right. Okay, uh, one more line. Shvu is happy We'll do a few more lines actually, if we have time, which I think we do. 
So the next item on the list that can be done in any language is Shavuos HaPikadon. The vow of Pikadon is like um, uh, custody, where I give you custody of something. Not like a, not a human, but I ask you to hold on to my phone for a day. And there are all kinds of levels of such custodians. Am I paying you? Are you doing to me as a favor? Are you renting it? Or are you borrowing it? There's four categories. Borrowing, renting, doing me a favor, or I'm paying you. Paid, unpaid, unpaid meaning you're doing me a favor. Uh, borrowing or renting. Did I miss any? I think those are the four categories. That's it. So, and under depending on the circumstances of what happened and what the terms and conditions of this whole the transaction, you might have to take an oath stating that you didn't neglect guarding that item properly. And for the fact that it's damaged, stolen, died, whatever it is, it's not your fault, depending on, this, on, the, depending on the arrangement. That's called Shavuot Sapikadon. So that too is on the list of, 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 of obligations that can be done in any language. So here says the Gemara, Shavuot Sapikadon, the vow of the custodian, if you want. So says the Gemara, how do we know this can be done in any language? Asya techta techta mishvu sevis. We established already earlier that the vow administered for the one who knows testimony can be done in any language. Even though I might have mistakenly thought that it's compared to the vow at the mountain and therefore done in the original Hebrew. But because the Torah says vishama, he has to hear it. So we say no, go back to the default and say it in any language. So the same exercise is done here. In the Shavuos HaPikada, in the vow of the custodian, maybe because it's a vow, I might have made a mistake and thought that it could be done, in, that it has to be done in the original Hebrew, just like the vow on the mountains. So says the Gemara, no, because the verse uses the same word to describe the vow of the witness and the vow of the custodian, indicating to us that they can be done in the same manner. This is the Xavier Shavuot, right? We've been asked to point out whenever the Gemara uses one of the 13 principles. This is one of the 13 principles. This Xavier Shavuot, when the Torah uses two, the same word, two different mitzvahs, depending on the circumstances, you may derive one law from the other. And that's what the Gemara is doing here. The Torah describes the, with the testimony of the custodian with the word tehta, someone who sins. And likewise, when it comes to the person who's being administered, or, Oath of testimony. The Torah also says tehta, and therefore we derive that it's going to be done in, it could be done in any language. Okay. So this concludes the Gemara going through the list of mitzvahs that can be done in any language. Now the Gemara shifts to that which can be done only in Lashon Kodesh in the original Hebrew. So we're going to read the Gemara's opening line, which gives us the framework from which we're going to and discuss the rest of the mitzvah that can be done in the original Hebrew. And that framework is, of course, these blessings and curses that is giving, that Moshe Rabbeinu and the Levites are giving to the Jewish people on the two mountains, which we know for sure was done in Hebrew. And the Mishnah just accepted that it was done in Hebrew. And then for any other mitzvah, which we can compare to those blessings and curses at the mountain, it has to be done in Hebrew. But, we, but the Mishnah never told us how we know that the curses themselves at the mountain were done in Hebrew. And that's what the Gemara is going to do for us now. So this becomes the framework for the classes going forward. Namely, the Eilun and Marim Belashon HaKadosh. The following are mitzvahs that can be done in any language. Bikurim, Chalitza, Ad Mikra Bikurim. The Gemara is telling us to look at the Mishnah, which goes through the whole list, and then compares it to the blessings and curses of the mountain. So Kate said, how do we get this whole comparison to the mountain? The verse says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the verse, uh, the way the, the Mishnah introduces the blessings and curses at the mountain when it compares it to the mitzvah of Bikurim. Bikurim is when the person brings the basket of fruit to the temple and there he, um, there he thanks Hashem for the land, right? Gives the whole history of how we were, our, the Aramite, Lavan, tortured my, our ancestor Yaakov, and then we went down to Egypt and you took us out of Egypt, you brought us the land and thank you very much and here's the fruits. And that whole passage is what we discussed in the Haggadah at great length. So that's when the Gemara introduced, that's when the Mishnah introduced the blessings and curses. Let's go down that exercise. Ketzad, from where do we derive Bikurim? That Bikurim, this declaration telling Hashem, thank you very much for the fruit, has been, with the whole history in the background, 
has to be said in the original Hebrew because it says, You shall respond and say, Before God your Lord. When you're standing in the temple, you shall respond and say the following words. And later, with respect to the blessings and the curses of the people at the mountain, who I the verse says, The Levites responded and said to all the Jewish people, this, the text of the blessing and the curse. So ma'ania, just as the response, right? As opposed to the Torah just saying they said, the Torah says res- they responded, the Levites responded to Moshe Rabbeinu and said the blessings and curses. And when the Torah says that you should make the declaration and thanking Hashem by the Bikurim, the Torah says, you shall respond and say, as opposed to just say. So because it added the word respond, or just as when it comes to the response of the Levites at the mountains, it's it's in the original Hebrew, original holy tongue, Afghan. So to hear with Bikurim, the Torah says, you shall respond and say, it's just got to be in the original Hebrew. But this is from the Mishnah already. Now the Gemara is going to add the lines that we did not have. Essentially what the Mishnah is telling us, whenever you find a mitzvah in which the Torah doesn't just say you shall say something, but Torah says you shall respond and say something, and that adding of the word respond tells you, compare it to the Levites that responded. But here's something the Gemara did not, the Mishnah. Rashi seems, and we looked at, when we looked at the Mishnah, we looked at Rashi, and Rashi seems to be saying that it is Xer Shah. Yeah. I thought it was a binyan av, but that was a mistake on my part because Ashi seems to be saying it's Zer Shavah. Binyan av is a different principle. A binyan av is when, when a certain item is established by one mitzvah, then it becomes a principle for all of Torah. And whenever you have the same circumstance, you can apply the same rubric. And I thought that's what's happening here. But so Rashi says it's Zer Shavah. Sorry? That's right. That's right. Rashi seems to be saying it's the wording issue and it's specifically Zer Shavah, not a binyan av. It was my mistake, but... Okay, so now this is the part that the Mishnah does not tell us. The Levi and Gufayu, and the, the Levites themselves, standing around the ark, circling the ark in the middle of the valley between the two mountains. They themselves, Minolo, and how do we know that they said it in the, in the original Hebrew? Who said that? So, Asya, Koel, Koel, and Moshe. We make another Xerah Shava using the word voice described by the Levites at the blessings and curses. And the same word, koil, verse, used by Moshe Rabbeinu when he delivers the message of Hashem on Shavuos, which we're about to approach to by the Ten Commandments. Siv Hacha, it says here, by the Levites, koil rom, a great voice, a loud voice, koil voice. Siv Hasam, and it says there, at the moment of Mount Sinai, at the moment of the Ten Commandments, Moshe Yedaber, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke, and God responds, so to speak, with a voice. Just as it is over there, when it came to the Ten Commandments, it was definitely in the original Lashon HaKodesh. Torah itself, the words of Torah were given in the Holy Tongue, right? the authenticity, even if we are allowed to interpret in other languages. Torah itself was given in Hashem's language. And there the Torah uses the word koil voice. So Afkan, so to hear with respect to the Levites, when the Torah again uses the word koil voice, there are two Lashon HaKadosh, the Holy Language. So now that we established that the Levim gave the blessings and curses in the original Hebrew, because it says the word voice, and that word voice is used to describe Moshe Rabbeinu speaking in Lashon HaKadosh. So so to any mitzvah, where it says respond, it's in Lashon HaKadosh. And which means, because right, this is the literal meaning of the Gemara, on a deeper level, we might say as follows. Any of these mitzvahs, what the Torah says to Satan, Lashon HaKadosh, is really derived back from Mount Sinai. Right? Which means, what the, Torah, what, what the Gemara is leading us to is, is that the, the, the revelation at Sinai, which is the most pure, authentic experience, Beyond any interpretation, all the Jewish people saw the exact same experience, which is why their souls left their body. They couldn't handle the overwhelming revelation of the divine. But it's, it's a revelation from above to below, right? We discussed the difference between Lashon HaKadosh being above to below, this is God's authentic language, versus our language from below to above, because we have to communicate to Hashem in the way we understand. So the ultimate authenticity that is uncorruptible is the revelation at Sinai. 
And that's the voice, the voice of revelation of Sinai. By extension, when Hashem says, you follow my Torah, you get blessings, you don't follow my Torah, God forbid the opposite. It's an extension of that authenticity. It's an extension of that revelation. Hashem's revelation is truth and conform or don't conform. Now, what's the word used in the Torah to describe all the other mitzvahs that all sorts of said in Lashon HaKadosh? Anisa, you should respond. In other words, there are some mitzvahs where Hashem says, speak to me in your language. And sometimes Hashem says, just respond after me. That's all. Just respond after me. Just repeat after me. Here's the words. Just, just mirror me. Forget you and how you feel and how you interpret. Just respond to me. It's these words, the voice of Hashem, and then the response. It's literally the words. When describing Hashem revealing to us at Sinai, it's the voice. When it describes Hashem revealing to us through the Levites, the voice. But then when it describes the mitzvah that we have to do also in the same language, it uses the word respond. It's no longer the voice. It's you letting go of what you think and just mirroring Hashem. In some ways, all of Torah has these two dynamics. On the one hand, for Torah, you have to process, you have to understand it. It's God's Torah. On the other hand, it's God's Torah. And all you're doing is responding. In fact, there's a famous expression that Chassidus quotes all the time, that when a person learns Torah, you should imagine that he's that he's a responder to the one reading. Hashem is responding the words with him as he's learning these words. It's not my thinking, it's Hashem's thinking. And as we come to Shavuos, this explains why the Chabad custom when we stay up all night on Shavuos is not to learn. Not to learn. We have a book called Tikkun where we just read, read. In fact, you, you finish, you, you're halfway through a subject and skip to the next subject. It's not about learning and understanding and processing on my terms. It's just about Banisa respond. These are Hashem's words and you just say them because they're Hashem's words. That's what's precious here is the fact that Hashem gave it. And if we don't, Interpret it. After Shavuos, we have a Kinnis Torah. After Shavuos, we have a Torah conference where people present their own. I, this is how they're ever set up Shavuos, right? The night of Shavuos, Hashem is speaking. We listen and respond. Just say the words. No process yet. Tomorrow, the day after Shavuos, Hashem, the Rebbe introduced the idea of Kinnis Torah, where you're supposed to present your own personal ideas at Torah. That's already your own interpretation. That's your own inter internalization. But that comes after the response. First of all, it's Hashem's voice, Vanisa, and we respond. And only later is there the internalization, right? It's the Nasa of Anishma. Right? We will do and we will listen. First, we do because you said, and then we can process and internalize. Two crowns. The two crowns. Okay, a wonderful day. Eden. And tomorrow we'll go through the list of mitzvahs that we have to say in the original Hebrew.